number of, of Armenians that are living there versus what used to live there in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there's a significant decrease. And what's more challenging is that the communities that they move to, whether it be Armenia or Russia or in particular um, uh, America or Australia, where that might be, aren't as well equipped to provide continuity in language and culture. It's because in those, most of those societies, it's easier to assimilate. There's, there are fewer people telling you that you can't be Armenian, and so there's less a reason to think about being Armenian. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it's true. And, and if we think about, you know, whereas we could, one could argue that after the genocide, Beirut or Aleppo or, or, or any of these communities that I just named were sort of the new centers for all of these things that I've listed in terms of language and culture and national identity to develop, those are no longer there. And the best place to do that is Armenia. The best place to do that is Armenia. Um, the second point is that a lot of us that come from, from the diaspora have sort of been defined, our identity, our identity has been defined by genocide recognition. And the reality is that 100 years have passed, and yes, we have to uh, be relentless in our pursuit of making sure that the genocide is recognized, uh, but at the same time, we need to move beyond that. And you know, when you're in a when you're in a community that's been defined by genocide because you're there because your parents were driven out of your homeland, you have a very different thinking than if, um, then uh, it's a very different thinking than if you're in a country that's trying, that is a homeland where you're trying to rebuild the country as long as, as, in, as opposed to asking somebody else to give you your lands back. It's a very different mentality. And the third point is, you know, tied to the second point, we are a sovereign state. You know, we're, we're a member of the United Nations. We're a member of a number of international organizations. We have a platform so, so that if we want to push the Armenian um, question forward, we have, a, we have a national sovereign platform to do that. Again, a lot of these things are, you know, we tend to forget them in the context of all the negative things that we want to talk about Armenia. So um, what does Repat Armenia do? We, have, we, we were established three years ago, and we have three main objectives and three main uh, directions that we pursue. One is promoting repatriation. So what we're doing today is exactly that, talking about uh, Armenia, talking about the opportunities in Armenia, talking about the importance of repatriation. And in addition to doing forums like this, uh, we have a Repat Armenia website. How many have seen the website? Okay, much fewer. So I, I encourage you after this session to at least take a look, repatarmenia.org where there are about 200 stories of people like me, many, of people like many of the people in the room that have come here from other countries as well as our fellow panelists, that just in their own words describe why they made the decision to move, what's worked, what hasn't, <clears throat> what hasn't worked, and we continue to add the, to those. We also talk about people that have established successful businesses and, and some of the other things that are what we call are moving forward in Armenia. Um, we also have a Facebook page, and we invite all of you to like the page because that's the best way to keep uh, uh, up to date with all the uh, new content, uh, not just within the site, but cool things that are going on uh, in Armenia and around the world. The second uh, sort of main activity is integration support. So once somebody's made the decision that they want to move or they're already here, we are available as a resource to help from everything from finding a job to getting advice on when you want to start a new business to, you know, if you have children, sort of what schools to put them in to what to do about health insurance to uh, helping out when people have uh, issues with customs or, or, or other government bodies. Now, the, obviously the Ministry of Diaspora also provides some level of support there. We tend to be very action-oriented and with our network of people we can usually get an answer pretty, quick, pretty quickly from other repats or people that we've worked with in the past. Um, and for, uh, in particular, uh, we've had over 600, if I'm not mistaken, people uh, have, that have come to us looking for jobs in Armenia and we've been able to help place almost 300 of those. So just uh, one, thing, one, one thing that we're very proud of over the last few years. The third uh, aspect is what we call development of pro-repatriation environment. That's basically lobbying, working not just with the Armenian government, but also with uh, Armenian organizations from around the world to bring the concept of repatriation, the idea of repatriation, back to the forefront. Because when, when we looked at this sort of a little more deeply, it wasn't on anybody's agenda. And uh, now we see progress being made by some international organizations and some small moves being made by the government. But we believe this is, if we want to have a strong state, if we want a strong nation that will also be a strong center for the uh, diaspora that we have around the world, it's really important that uh, these formal bodies be part of that uh, as well. 
I'm not going to go into detail on this. We can make the slides available later. But this talks about uh, the results that we've had in terms of what type of assistance. So on the left, you see that 75% of people that come to us are really are looking for help in uh, finding employment. Uh, and then uh, the, the next big chunk at 8% of people that want to establish businesses, networking legal, and you can go down the page there. And then on the country of origin, we've had 45% uh, from Syria, obviously, because of the terrible situation in Syria and the large inflow of, of um, people that we've had come to Ar Armenians that have come from Syria, uh, they, they represent the, the largest um, block of people that we've worked with. But then you see 15% USA, 12% Russia, 12% Lebanon, Iran, uh, and so forth. And uh, as time goes on, you know, when we first started, it was the first year of the of the Syrian crisis, so that you know that number would have been instead of 45 percent would have been 60 or 70 percent, and over time it's it's becoming more more balanced. And you can see that um, uh, we've placed over 1,200 vacancies on our website. Uh, we've uh, worked with actually 1,300 people, uh, 260 people employed. Sorry, I thought that, uh, I think I said 280, and we've had over 3,000 diaspora Armenians attend our various Imagine Armenia forums over the last, in particular, over the last two years. Um, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but one of the things we like to do is support businesses that have either been started by a diaspora and army by, by repats or that cater to repats. And there's an example of different kinds of both or businesses, organizations that we've worked with in a variety of different fields. And you know, these are all people that have said, you know, I'm going to make this work and have established uh, uh, these companies um, or these organizations working on everything from helping border villages to uh, making shoes and boots in Armenia. And this is really, um, you know, people say that the heart of any uh, economic growth is a small, medium sized, a small, medium sized enterprise market. And this is an example of the kind of people that we work with. Okay, uh, this is uh, last slide uh, before we get to the panel. So basically, um, what the, the process to engage with us is, if you're thinking about uh, repatriation as an option, this could, you know, maybe you're here uh, temporarily as, a, as an exchange student, or you've got family that's thinking about sort of uh, considering what's going on in Armenia. Um, uh, once you contact us, we have specialists that will sit down with you and try to figure out sort of why you're coming, what, would, what, what you would like to do, what stage are you in your life, and, and, um, uh, and how to help integrate with the other repats in the community. We encourage people, for those people that don't live here, to do a pilot trip to come and spend more than a few days, spend a couple of weeks, a month if they can, learning more about the sectors that they're interested in working in or establishing a business in, talking to people to find out what life is like. Um, so real, essentially doing an internship or volunteering in different areas just to get more acquainted with what life is here, what life is like here. And then the next point is actually when you're formally looking for employment or education, we help to match you with employers or, or, or explain the various options that you have. And then finally, at the very end, uh, helping with logistics, uh, uh, legal status in Armenia and some of the other things that are sort of more formal. So we're ready to engage with any of you or your friends or family along any of these points. And again, the best way to do that is to uh, go to our website and contact us uh, via the website. Okay, um, so that's it for the formal part. We're on Facebook at Repat Armenia, uh, YouTube channel. Most of you or some of you, whoever, whoever has not had a guide's language, and I highly recommend that you do. It reminds me of my childhood. Uh, I'm sorry? Address is on Nalbanyan Street, basically right up, right across from the metro, Republican Square Metro. There's a building with white columns. It's in the basement. It says, Guys Lamajun, you have to try it. It's fantastic. Okay, so uh, thank you for your patience. I think I went through this fairly quickly. Uh, I'm now going to go back to the panel and ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, um, you know, uh, in including where you came from, how long you've been here, and uh, what you do. And then, again, the most important part for us is to answer your questions, so we hope that we can do that as well. Thank you. Okay. So maybe I'll start. Uh, my name is Vartan Marashlian. I moved to Armenia in 2010 from Russia. I used to live there for 30 years. I was born here, but spent most of my life there. I'm an economist by profession and worked in different fields. I'm one of co-founders and executive director of Repat Armenia starting from the first days. I moved here 
uh, with my wife and uh, daughter, and now we have a son uh, who was born here. I'm very proud of that. So our family is growing here. We're happy of being here. There are a lot of different type of difficulties, but in general, I would say it's a choice. I mean, what's good about repatriation is that you've lived in different places. You know good sides and bad sides of living all over the world, and you decide that this place is better for you. So, and you have an ownership feeling about the country. So basically, I'm living here uh, for five years. We'll be happy to answer the questions. Thank you. My name is William Bayramian. I moved to Armenia six months ago, about in June, uh, after getting married. Uh, not because I got married, uh, <laughs> right? I've always wanted to come to Ar well, not always, but I wanted to come to Armenia for for a while, and uh, thankfully, it happened. Uh, when people ask me how it is living here, I tell them that I'm living the dream because I actually think that this was the dream ju not just for myself but also for the Armenian people for a very long time and this is our opportunity to live it. Uh, I'm originally, I don't know if I said this or not, but I'm from California. Uh, I tell most people that I'm from Los Angeles, but because you're Armenian you'll know where I'm really from, which is Glendale. Uh, <laughs> My I, and I, and I, uh, I would like to echo what Vartan was saying, which is, you know, there, uh, there are obviously lots of difficulties here, but I also think that one of the, uh, or where I come from, which is uh, California, which used to be part of the Wild West, uh, influenced my ability to deal with whatever situation I might confront in Armenia, because I see it as a place which has a lot of opportunity. Um, and I see it as a place where people who are willing to take that opportunity despite the difficulties can make it into uh, a really wonderful place, the type of place that they want it to be, which is what California was for a lot of people uh, 100 years ago, and I uh, see Armenia being uh, the same type of place now. Yep. <clears throat> Hi. My name is Rafi, I'm from Montreal, and I have a number of degrees that I can't remember right now, mostly in economics and political science. I moved to Armenia in 2011, and I run a startup here um, called uh, Get Treated, so gettreated.co if you want to check it out, and tell all your friends, of course. Um, um, I'm, I moved here because <laughs> I, I, this is the least number of words I've ever heard Rafael Yotian speak. So this yeah. is why <laughs> no, I, I'm known amongst most as a man of few words, but uh, every word I say has so much meaning that I hope that you'll all be able to understand. But uh, essentially, I moved here 2011. I came here. Um, I think I've always wanted to come here, mostly because uh, my mother was heavily involved in the medical sector here. She's a dentist from. Montreal, originally from Syria, uh, and so we had the opportunity to come to Armenia at least once a year for two or three months out of the year for most of my life, and so I've always quite well acquainted here, and things, despite everything being so crazy and not having water or internet or whatever for a long time, things made more sense here than elsewhere, and so when I had the opportunity after moving, after living in a few other places, namely Amsterdam and Dubai, I made the move here. Uh, I also got hitched. This time I married into the local population. And, you know, I'm happy here. <laughs> I could also give you, you know, the whole romantic spiel about how it's the, the homeland and how my, my grandparents cried when they heard that I was moving to Armenia. But you guys already know that. So, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm also from Canada, actually, from Toronto. My name is Tamar Najarian. I moved here in 2013. Um, I am also hitched <laughs> officially, um, also to a local. No, both officially and non-officially. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Canada, he's from here. Um, I moved here because, well, life appeared much better here, actually. It was a lot slower than what I was used to in Canada. It was a lot more fulfilling. And at the end of the day, it's where I saw a future for a family. 
I did not want to get stuck in Canada by finding someone there, and I did not want to get into any businesses or any career there that might hold me back from moving here. Um, I don't think anybody cried other than saying, why are you going? And I'm pretty sure everybody had some sort of bet going on as to how long I would last, and I have beat all of them. The Very. still going. So is it? I have some money at stake. In it. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm also the integration manager at Repad Armenia, so if anybody has any questions or needs any help in any way, then contact me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nairi Grace Bardakchan. I didn't move to Armenia, my parents did. They did in 1991, and it wasn't a choice I made. However, now being over 18, which I hope you can notice, um, it's my choice staying here, and me and my husband, have chosen staying here at the moment. We love it here. I was born in Pasadena and we moved to Armenia in 1991. My parents were missionaries. And as kids, I had two younger siblings, uh, one year old and three year old. As kids, would, would, we didn't notice much of the difficulties we were facing. Like, like that mentioned, no electricity, no water, no heating. Besides the fact that my sister would cry, it was too cold. But we really did enjoy our childhood and teenage years here, really. When I was thinking today before coming here, it's like, what did we miss? Chuck E. Cheese, Disneyland? I mean, we played hide and seek under trees, bro. All we had was snow, all we had was woods to, like, to cut down trees and have fun with them, to lit the, make a fire. And it, we really had some times we'll never forget in our lives just because of the fact that my parents decided to move here in 1991. However, I'm a triple major musician. Besides that, I'm an AA alumni. I did my MBA here. Now I'm doing my TEFL degree, which is my fifth master's degree. But what I wanted to stress is that AUA has been really a solid platform I've been able to stand on and move forward. Um, I, I teach English and I prepare for exams like TOEFL, GMAT, IELTS, etc. And I'm a simultaneous interpreter. And if not for AUA, I mean, nobody told me that this is an AUA like, commercial thing, but I really want to stress that if you are in Armenia and if you really need a solid foundation, there are people, there are institutions, not many, but there are some who truly are there to just be a foundation for you. And I found a few good connections, good friends, people from abroad, local people. And I've had some excellent faculty who have just been standing by my side when I needed them. There are many difficulties in Armenia, but there are many solutions too. So for me, the answer is, if you do want to move, there are difficulties, but there are many opportunities, like many of my friends said. So we're ready for uh, questions and answers, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you. Thank you all. I guess just a couple of words about me personally. Um, I was born in Lebanon, uh, but grew up for most of my life in the San Francisco Bay Area, went to university there, and spent most of my career in technology in Silicon Valley. Um, I lived here in the early 90s, right after independence, 92, 93, so I know your parents, and you were very, very small when I, uh, when I was at your house. Um, and, uh, and I uh, uh, worked for a year and a half before going back to get my MBA, met my wife here, and I knew that I was going to come back, but I wanted to come back on my terms. So it was very important for me to establish a family, establish, more importantly, establish a career in a way that uh, would, uh, and, and, and to come here at a time that it wasn't just, you know, it's the homeland, you know, I have to go and see Ararat every day, but really, what, you know, where can I be where I can not only make a difference, but actually be fulfilled both professionally and personally. And we've been here, now we moved here, uh, seven years ago in 2000, <coughs> excuse me, 2008 with two young children who are now teenagers, which is very interesting all in, of itself, um, and uh, haven't regretted one minute of being here. And in fact, the more we're here, the more we get not just tied to this place, but, <coughs> excuse me, understand how Armenia has so much potential to be uh, part of what's going on globally. Um, I see that every day. I see that in, in the work that I do. I see it in the, in the students that I teach. I see that in all of the sort of the winners of Olympiads and different things, whether that's in, in music or science or whatever that might be. We have a really strong base here. And all we need to do is work together to make that base and to, to sort of propel us to the next level, which I'm convinced that we can. So that was that. The, the end was a little bit of a rah-rah speech. Um, so that's 
this is really more about listening to your questions and trying to answer them as well as we can. So what I, with that, I'd like to invite whoever their microphones uh, on either side. Uh, and we're, for any of us are, are, are ready to answer your questions. Hello. Hey, Rafi. Thank you so much, all of you. Really enjoyed it. <coughs> sort of AUA is an interesting place to be having sort of this interesting talk because AUA is an institution that is inculcating in a new generation of local Armenians sort of new ways of thinking, new ways of sort of orientating themselves in relationship to the rest of the world. The, um, and the REPET organizations are uh, doing something on similar lines through a different mechanism, right? Through immigration, bringing people into the country uh, from outside who are also bringing new resources and new ways of thinking. Do you find that these two trajectories are parallel or that they in any way sort of uh, diverge. <clears throat> you have people coming in and also uh, an inculcation of a new, uh, new generations uh, of Armenians locally. Thank you. Um, I think that there are many ways to move this country forward. And one of the things that I didn't mention that we do when we do these Imagine Armenia forums is that we often will go with AUA, TUMO, uh, and some of the other organizations that are also trying to sort of raise the bar for Armenia. And, um, you know, another way to phrase your question, maybe a more direct way to phrase your question is, is AUA really preparing people for le to leave Armenia while we're preparing people to, you know, convincing people to come back. And, you know, I, uh, I, I teach marketing, or I, uh, I teach marketing as part of the courses that I teach. And there's this thing called a response rate, right? So when you send out uh, in the U.S., for example, millions and millions of direct mail or emails or whatever that might be, or you have your um, uh, Google, uh, you know, paid search ads everywhere. The 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 percentage that you expect to respond in in a manner that will significantly drive your business forward is very small. And I sort of think about Armenia the same way. I mean, we have. Uh, three million, two and a half million people here. Seven and a half Armenians around the world. Seven and a half million Armenians around the world, and it, we don't need also. We, in fact, we couldn't. We wouldn't know what to do if seven and a half million people moved back. But individuals that moved back, whether it was the team that started AUA in 1990, or whether it's Sam Simonian at Tumo, or Rupen Vartanian and all the work that he's doing in in tourism, these are individuals that whose impact is far greater than the straight numbers of immigration or emigration would say. So my goal, when people say, well, um, you know, whether it's a Luis program or AUN, but you know, these are encouraging people, preparing people to leave, that's true. And will all of them come back? Absolutely not. Right? But the 5% or 7% that come back, and these are statistics we've seen from things like Birthright Armenia and the other organizations, are the ones that not only want to come back, have a purpose to come back, and want to make a difference. And that's, that's really, so that's why I, I think they're very congruent. I don't see anything so that, that, that takes them apart. Do you mind if I add to that? Um, well, I also studied at AUA, so one of my masters is from here, um, as you know, I think. But um, I just wanted to point out that I think if those who want to leave do leave, I mean, it's not because they went to AUA that they're going to leave or because they used the uh, Luis Foundation or whatever. If, I mean, if people who are looking for opportunities to leave will, will find them. Um, if I can speak from my own class, I think that there's only out of 32 students, there's one of them who's currently abroad, but that's because he's doing a PhD at uh, LSE. Uh, everybody else is here and the vast majority of them have jobs or or are working on very interesting projects. And I could tell you that um, if, I, if I remember the level we had when we first started together, I, w I was in a different place because I, I had gone through the Canadian education system, whereas those here had a lot to catch up on. But by the, by the end of the two years, I think we were really on the same level and all of these people who graduated with me uh, are really already making a difference and it's being felt. I've been at AUA for the last um, six, seven years, and what I can tell is mediocre education sends people out, because Armenia is a place for good, high-quality professionals, and most of my classmates have excellent jobs. Why would they leave? So in my case, it's like good education, good opportunities in Armenia stay. There's a question up here. Can we get a microphone? Uh Uh, 
I was uh, watching a debate uh, not long time ago, and uh, it was uh, the rector of the um, uh, Bedagan University, um, and, uh, State University, and others. And um, uh, so one person asked, we don't know how many graduates you have. And the other rector says, okay, uh, well, we can give you that number, but all our graduates, they have high positions abroad. And I am thinking, why can't we leave? Why can't we uh, keep those uh, uh, bright uh, people here? So uh, I don't know, I wanted to ask you, but maybe I had some, um, I had the answer to my questions, but I want to know if uh, uh, the graduates at AUA are staying here or leaving? Thank you for the question. As I mentioned, this is my second master's at AUA, so I have like 200 course mates. And the majority of them are here working at international organizations like KPMG, Grant Thornton, like, like companies that really offer them good job opportunities. As I said, if you're a professional in your field, you do find good jobs in Armenia. But remember the word if. I have many other friends, I've studied at the conservatory, um, they're all around the world because music doesn't pay well in Armenia. But on the other hand, there are other professions. I am a triple major musician, now I teach English. Why? Because I want to stay here. If I loved music more than I loved Armenia, I'd be doing music elsewhere. So it's a choice to make, but to answer your question, there's a certain level of education. If you're above, even a country like Armenia, who has difficulty in providing jobs for everybody, will provide one for you, if you are above a certain level. On the average, I don't know, maybe others have other things to ha say, but I've seen good professionals with good job opportunities in Armenia. But are they staying here? Yes, my fr I, I have like 150, 200 friends, like graduates of AUA, they are here. I have one friend who's in Silicon Valley, um, and that was a transfer from Synopsis or Synergy, I don't remember, but most of them are here with awesome jobs. They don't want to leave. Um, you know, the, there's a little pa pathway that goes under the new building that goes, you know, when you, when you want to pass the park and then it brings you down to the street and it has a plaque on it that says that it was generously uh, financed by the first graduating year of AUA of 1992. Um, I did a bit of research and I found out that actually every single one of the graduates left. Um, but then I met a lot of them here, actually. So most, literally all of them left. The entire class left the country when they had the opportunity to. Many of them made a lot of money abroad, and which allowed them to finance part of the construction of this building we're sitting in. But then many of them also returned. So it's not about them leaving at all. In fact, I don't like telling people not to leave. I think it's very hypocritical. But on the other hand, uh, you know, just find your way back. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm, I actually represent one of the uh, those early years of AVA alumni, and um, and I'm one of them who left to to do my PhD and eventually stay there. Just to comment, then, uh, comment and question. So it's not just being a good profession; you'll find the job here. I, I'll disagree. You'll find some jobs in some sectors. IT sector would be one of them, maybe. Uh, but my my. Maybe question would be, and I don't know if it's related to Repat Armenia, uh, because it's a really nice thing to see that there is an organization w working for this. So it's mostly for people maybe who are abroad to, to bring them back to Armenia. But <clears throat> in terms of repatriation, we're still considering, and I have a generation, it's like many, many people, I'm also in Silicon Valley, uh, who, who live and, and work there and, and uh, have our own small community. Uh, and there's always discussion of returning to Armenia, right? So, and returning and coming back. And if we come back, we will not face many of those issues that you have because we know the country, we know the language, we know the government, some like how it works. Uh, however, there is um, there is this issue, or maybe uh, the feeling that coming back here, if you, I mean, other than finding the job, right? So. Um, uh, the legality of the country, or like how, and it's again mo n not the question to you. Maybe, maybe the more mostly to the the government that being a legal country or in a country uh, and and then if you're working with that type, that group of of re repats, like the, the people who 
maybe not necessarily graduates of AUA, but people who came and made a career, made, became a professional so can come back and really help build their own country, our own country. So that's like if, if you're working in that area too, and I'd love to talk to you maybe afterwards more details. Absolutely. I mean, um, in fact, there's an opportunity. We've been trying to push this whole concept of data science and data analytics forward at AUA. And in my last trip to the U.S., I met with several Armenians that left from here that were PhDs from, uh, you know, physics uh, or applied math at Yerevan State that are now working that have broad experience in the states in this field. And well, we had this particular problem, and within three days, we had the most complete answers of how to pursue these things. Uh, and my point is that when we talk about re repatriation, when we talk about engaging with Armenia, it doesn't mean drop everything and move your whole family here and you're stuck here. There are a lot of people that come and go. There are people that are based here that work abroad and where their families are here, or the other way around. They work abroad and come here and work on specific projects. So I think we need to, um, you know, in... 1946, 1947, people literally, you know, left everything, came here, and had a very difficult time of it. And the good news is that with globalization, with internet, with all the things that are going on, it's the world is more fluid, and people are more connected. So I think if we think about it more broadly, you know, maybe you know somebody like with PhD comes back and does a seminar here every couple of years in a way that trains the next generation of people that are going to do startups or be in a medical field, whatever the field may be. Um, that's what that's what we miss. I think what we need to move away from, though, what we need to move away from is sort of the traditional diaspora thinking, which is is you know I'll give my thousand dollars a year and you know build a build a school somewhere and then you know I feel happy I've done my part and then they can do their part. That mentality has to change. We're all responsible for making this a better country. And and even somebody in the diaspora who has no intention of moving here but is extremely patriotic and and sort of you know proud proud to be Armenian. I would say that in 25 years, if there's not a strong Armenia, there will be the, the diaspora will be a very different diaspora than we see it today. So it's 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 as much for them as it is for us. If I can add a few things here, um, based on your comments and uh, your question, I think one of the important things is also to change the narrative, and that's something that a Repat has been doing. Uh, and I think that generally that idea has to spread a little more uh, uh, to a broader audience in Armenia and uh, throughout the diaspora. Uh, for example, this question that you brought up about it being an Orinakan Yerkij or you know being like a country of law. Uh, there are laws in Armenia, okay, just like there are laws in other countries, and there are people in Armenia who break the law just like there are people in other countries who break the law. The question there, okay, is how you interact with that, how you react to that, okay, how uh, responsible agencies who are responsible for enforcing the law are uh, held to uh, account. And that's what's important in Armenia. Okay, so we can't continue to uh, talk about, you know, uh, Armenia not being a country of no laws, okay, when uh, there are laws here, and one of the problems is that, not, you know, it's not just the people who are up top who are breaking the law, but everybody's breaking the law, right? Because, uh, you know, they say, well, the cops are breaking the law, so I'm going to break the law too. Well, it doesn't work that way, right? And the, the point is that you can't, uh, uh, you can't leave the country and then follow other people's laws and then complain about you know uh, the laws which aren't being applied in Armenia. And the other thing is that I wanted to talk about is the opportunities that are, that are in Armenia. Armenia doesn't have opportunities in every industry. We understand that, okay? It might have a lot of opportunity in IT, but it might not have opportunity in something else that you want to do. Art or, uh, you know, it doesn't have the same art scene or the music scene that New York does. Okay, but one thing that was really uh, impressive to me, having lived in the United States my whole life, uh, almost, was that you know when you when you encountered people who would say that there isn't this thing. Okay, we want this thing to happen, rather than you know talking about how it doesn't exist, they would try to create it. And I think that that also has to resonate. That, that that concept has to resonate with Armenians is that if it doesn't exist here that doesn't mean that it can't exist here 
and you can create it and you don't have to go somewhere else where it already exists thanks other questions could you pass the microphone please thank you I want a, a little bit of clarification about the repat army. Are we preventing people to leave more or we uh, encouraging people to come? That's one question. And uh, we're not preventing. I mean, we'll maybe make them to stay. If that's the fo what's the focus of repat. Number two, uh, what is... Uh, the studies or you have any outcome if you look up after the independence how many left and what is the trend today and what if there are type of peoples based on their skills or what is the focus of repat uh, who we would like to see here in Armenia from diaspora if that's a if there is a stereotype of that and what is the really the focus still? I mean, I heard lots of things about Libat, but what really we would like to do? What if we're going to see a change in this country that is not taking place someplace else? What is that? And what is the target audience, or who are you targeting at? The graduates or others, business people? And another question. <laughs> Uh, the challenges, what, been, what has been the challenges uh, that people, they leave or they don't come? Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, well, we try to get information and statistics. Unfortunately, the state doesn't have statistics on repatriation, but there are some estimates. The estimates are that approximately 40,000 people moved to Armenia since independence on a voluntary basis. We're not talking a big inflow of pe people from Baku. Which, has, which was more than 300,000 people, or uh, it doesn't count also, for example, 15, 16,000 Syrian Armenians who live in Armenia today, and they just recently moved during the last two, three years. Our target are, let's say, brain gain, high impact repatriation. So people, especially with innovative ideas, people who are not afraid to start something interesting, something new, which is missing in Armenia, and know exactly why they are moving to Armenia. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, the choice is a very important thing. If you make a decision based on a choice, it's much more sustainable and you spend much more efforts on this. Why people are leaving Armenia is not only because of the economic conditions, but also they never experienced of living outside of Armenia. And they has nothing to compare with. They have kind of very let's say, rosy expectations of uh, Canada, USA, Russia, and they think it's very easy. Everyone is waiting for them and they don't know what means to keep, uh, I mean, to stay Armenian, to speak the language. So this is the value. And for many locals, it's not the value because they, they get it from the first day and they don't know that it might disappear outside of Armenia. So our target are mostly young people from 25 to 35. And basically, they mostly apply to us. Uh, those who just graduated, they, they, moving to Armenia does necessarily should be uh, for, 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 for the whole life. It can be in several like stages. The first is when you graduate, you have a possibility to have internship in different countries and to try your, uh, yourself in other culture in other country. This is a great opportunity for people to come, to stay here for one, two years, then understand whether they want to stay here for long term. That's the way it happened for me, for example. I came here when I was 24 years old, spent two and a half years. They moved back to Russia, but with a clear plan to move back again to Armenia when I'm, I'll be more ready for that. So. So the first is just graduates. The second is when people uh, have their own family. They got married. They have a child. And of course, it's much more difficult to move to Armenia when the child is 10, 12 years old rather than when he is or she is uh, like four or five years old. So that's, that's the target. We want to help especially those people to come to Armenia who can make a difference and can, can create precedents. And there are quite a lot of people who do a lot of interesting work here. And in the economic sector, for example, if we took at the winery sector, so during the last five years, most of the changes are due to repats. We have brilliant wines like Garas, Katarov, Vanardi, Armas, and most of the investors are repats or the managers are repats. The same with the touristic sector. The first bed and breakfasts outside of Armenia. The first good restaurants 
in in in, in Armenia in Yerevan. Uh, in IT sector, there is quite a lot of involvement in uh, societal development. For example, Sahman NGO, which is helping the bordering villages in Tavush region, a lot of repats are involved. So we are looking for that kind of people. Danny, you have a follow up? <laughs> I think they absolutely are. In fact, um, one of the things we've uh, we've uh, we've begun to do, we haven't brought it to conclusion yet, is that um, there are several organizations. You know, I've, I've I've talked about obviously AUA. I've talked about Birthright Armenia, Tumo, um, Louis Foundation, Idea Foundation, what, that are all in one way or another sort of trying to engage people in the diaspora to become more vested in Armenia. So by either literally, you know, uh, paying into the, you know, contributing to the AUA endowment fund or sending their kids to be part of Birthright Armenia or or having their kids apply to Loose, Loose Foundation, whatever that might be. And the common thing was whenever they go to the diaspora to give a, fir a presentation about whatever project they're working on, the first 45 minutes are spent trying to basically break apart people's myths of Armenia, which tend to be very negative. So one of the things we talked about doing was having essentially a, a one standard deck. The first five slides are, you know, the real Armenia. And then you get to talk about AUA or Luis or IDEA or whatever that is. And, and we even thought about doing joint road shows, and we've done joint road shows, and it's been very successful. So it's not just us sort of talking about the concepts, it's other people presenting actual projects. I mean, Tumo is producing 5,000 kids a year that have, that, are, that have a new reality, that think about life different. Now, will all of them turn into expert animators or graphic designers or, or, or game developers? Of course not. But that's when, you know, it's, it's the same concept of return, you know, your return on investment is not going to be 100%. But, you know, I'll take the 5% or 10% that are going to go to do great things. And, and that's what, so when we talk about AUA trying to pick the best and brightest from uh, the school system in Armenia and from abroad, what do we want? We want the best and brightest to then graduate and do great things. Uh, when when, uh, when uh, IDEA, found, whoever it is, when Luis Foundation is giving scholarships, it's all the same point. It's all about um, uh, aren't satisfied with the status quo, that aren't satisfied with just saying, I'm going to get out of here. Right? Uh, it's people that want to actually make a difference. Um, yes, sorry, go ahead. I'd just like to add one more thing, just seeing that I'm the probably freshest student from AUE now, from the panel. What I'd really want to share with you is the fact that I told you I've, I've, I've done two masters here at AUA, so I've had awesome faculty to deal with. And one thing I've really learned throughout my, these course of years I've been studying here is I've really undergone a change in my own mentality. I was from the States myself, but before AUA, I was like, really, this country does suck. And I really want to go. Sorry for saying that. But now, all my teachers, the way they just interacted with us, not what they taught us, but the way they lived their lives in front of our eyes was so different and so real. It just changed my whole life. Let, let me just bring a little example. The first day I entered AUA, it's, it's a really, really tiny example, but I'm sure it'll resonate. I did cheat. Last month, I was teaching here at the extension. I cried when my students cheated. My mentality had changed like 180 degrees. Like, I'm not here the one to assess you, to grade you, to teach you. I'm your friend. I'm here to support you because that's what I saw from AUA. I didn't saw them teaching me. I saw them being a friend, supporting me, guiding me, and regarding like jobs and everything. When I, I, I feel like many of you were, are worried that AUA is prepare, preparing professionals to leave, 
AUA has opened so many doors for me and my co course mates regarding um, job opportunities and so really I personally wouldn't worry about AUA sending professionals out. They do a lot of work, um, the career center, our professors, our colleagues, they work really hard to help us like stay here and really build a better future for Armenia in Armenia. Um, may I add to that as well, if possible? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, um, Dr. Clark, I've never cheated while I was at AUA. <laughs> and uh, but to answer your question more specifically, as per our previous discussions, of course, um, I always saw my, my coming to AUA actually as being uh, really primordial to my integration into Armenian society, actually. Because in the, in the previous times in which I had been here more as a, as a tourist or as a volunteer and so on and so forth, it was originally quite more difficult for me to connect with the local population, um, most for different reasons, basically, basically because we had somehow different conceptions of being of the concept of Armenianness, right? In the diaspora, of course, it's a question of preserving identity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, whereas here is just a statement of fact; it's a reality. Um, and um, you know, especially with people of an older generation, of the Soviet generation, with which I didn't feel like I shared any uh, cultural or other attachment. Uh, and before the internet, I suppose also the young people in Armenia were also very cut off from the rest of the world, so there were very few uh, cultural or you know, pop culture things you could share with them. Uh, but And then when I moved to Armenia four years ago, I was to a certain extent, of course, I already spoke Armenian before coming here, and um, it, was, it was easy for me to build a network, but if I, if I could say in the first couple of years, I would say more than half of my network were fellow repatriates or other diasporans or expats and so on, and a smaller number were local. And when they were local, I think 75% of them tended to be women uh, for some obvious and some less obvious reasons, I think. But uh, essentially, I think when I came to, to AUA, the first, um, the first year was interesting because, again, we started off from different points, right? I mean, I had gone through the Canadian education system, whereas everybody else had mostly graduated from YSU or Brusov. And you know there are there's a clash of of uh, educational styles and uh, mentalities and so on. But uh, essentially, what it meant is because they say AUA is sort of like a, an elite school as far as Armenia is concerned, and therefore you had some of the best and the brightest in the country in the classroom with me. I felt like I was able to I, all, all those other uh, let's say if 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 the Armenian identity is like an onion, then all of those other things were peeled away, you know, the, the Soviet uh, mentality versus the Western mentality, and we were able to find a common core and share ideas much better. And essentially, by now, I mean, I had a built-in uh, network of local friends of my generation who think, at least if they don't think in a way that's ideal to me, uh, uh, identical to me, I think very few people tend to. But generally speaking, um, I find true. people I can have... I, f I found people that I can have, you know, common grounds with, which has helped me be a more effective part of the society here and understand this place better than that of simply being an outsider, because I no longer feel like an outsider. Thank you. We made a survey, uh, actually, and more than 200 EPS took part in the survey, which showed that uh, those who stay here long term, more than half of their friends are locals, which is a very good sign. So. Uh, almost 70% of their friends are locals. So it's a matter of time and uh, coming from our experience, I, I need to confess that the problem is not, you know, if we talk about integration, it's not only on, on the local side, because it's too many, I think, more than a cultural country still, but it, the problem is also on the repat side, because some of them are uh, really trying to show the difference and uh, are not keen on integration, at least in the first stage. So one of our tasks as a repat Armenia Foundation is through connection with those who moved to Armenia, to help with the soft landing, not only employment opportunities, not only set up a business, but also to make people feel that they are part of the society. So instead of a Syrian Armenian opening a Lama Jun place and only 10,000 Syrian Armenians have been aware of that place, we're trying to help him uh, to be connected with a bigger local world. Long term, when we say long term, uh, for us it's, let's say, eight, ten, eight to ten years and coming from, again, from our experience, uh, though we operate only three years, but uh, the, the percentage of successful repatriation is approximately 70 to 80 percent. 
uh, I'm, I can make a comparison with the Jewish experience, and they are very experienced. They have a lot of resources which they spend during uh, many decades. The successful repatriation rate for those who move to Israel from USA is 50 percent. From other countries, is bigger. My, oh, it works. Um, originally, I'm from Moscow, um, and I, uh, I thought spontaneously uh, that I might. I might ask you a question request because you all guys are powerful here. Um, a couple of words about the context. Uh, as I grew up in Moscow, but I was born in Yerevan, um, and I moved uh, around one and a half year ago. And uh, currently, I'm. I feel that I'm missing something that I had opportunity to. Uh, have in Moscow, in Toronto too. That's you might have heard of it. It's a Gurdjieff groups, and um, accidentally um, it took place. It started from here because I, you might know also Michael Pittman, who was a professor of here uh, in American University, and. Uh, he suggested some some people from New York City to come and found a group here, but currently the group group there is no group at the moment, and uh, we're, we're trying. Me personally, I try to inspire people, the rest of the people who live here, and the the, the request part of my question is about having place because we gather in somebody's apartment, but it's not correct. Uh, we should have a place, and the place should be equipped with a piano or something like that in order to produce movements. And it's something I miss because, uh, and I traveled a lot uh, in California and in New York City in the search of some people who might come here and found again or to continue this. And now uh, the I, I don't know the second from from Wartan, he he just said the words that I, I should not. Um, nobody should expect that somebody would come and continue something. I decided to to give something that I got from Moscow group, uh, and uh, I repeat it once again. The problem is that we don't have a place, preferably in downtown Yerevan. Okay. My suggestion would be as follows. I mean, uh, we have an Armenian Repatriates Network close Facebook group. First, I would uh, ask you to share that uh, your thoughts with the group because there are quite a lot of people and maybe someone will uh, reflect on, on your suggestion. We, we can also can introduce your idea through the website and promote it so that we can find uh, people who might be interested in cooperation on that. Okay, thanks. Good. Any other questions up here? No. Um, I wanted to speak a bit to the question of temporality. Um, I have a short anecdote, if I may. Um, one of the inspirations I had actually for moving to Armenia was uh, another couple from Montreal, Rafi Nizibliyan and Lara Haronia. Uh, Rafi's parents went to church with us, and Lara's mom was my math teacher, and her brother was my scout leader, so we were very close with their family, and when I finally, and he had moved to Armenia about 10 years before I did, and I, I'd interned at his company several times before coming, and when I did, um, my father had called me one time and asked me how Rafi was, he's been there 10 years, is he considered a local yet? And my answer to him was that, that in, in the province of Vyotstor, there are people who moved there in 1828 because of the Treaty of Trukmenchai, and they're still considered Norig. And so he's only been there 10 years. I think he's got another, you know, six generations or so. <laughs> so I don't know. It's a question of how you want to consider yourself to be long term, I think. Yes, Nadek. Those are great questions. So uh, actually, uh, Vartan Marashlian was the deputy minister of diaspora before he joined us as executive director. And he actually took that position 
because he believed so uh, so much in the concept of repatriation. We uh, we do work with the with the Ministry of Diaspora and other uh, elements of the Armenian government. Um, where you know we help them with surveys. We uh, Vartan sits on the board of the board of advisors of the, of the ministry. Um, now, are we satisfied with the level of um, commitment or intensity on the part of the government to drive this forward? No. Do we bring it up in various contexts, including with the president, with you know other uh, members of government? Absolutely. Um, we uh, we also, in fact, during our last visit to um, to Beirut a couple of weeks ago, we did meet with uh, Aram Katolikos. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion um, because, and actually, it was a, the 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 thing that was really interesting to me about that discussion was that he really represented sort of the closed view that people have because he comes here for very specific purposes, meets with very specific people, and ends up having a very black and white but incorrect view of what's going on here. I mean, he'd never been to Tumo. He'd never, you know, there's things that are just that show a completely different reality that he just doesn't see. And it's not through any fault of his own. It's just the reality of the way these things are done. You know, people will come here on a two-week vacation and go to Gadni Gerat Sevan and, you know, love, you know, uh, drinking, you know, in cafes or, 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 or in one of the bars on Pushkin Street. And that's the reality of what this country is. And that is part of the reality, but it's not the whole reality. Um, I think we've been we've been actually working quite a bit with AGBU, and in fact, the AGBU has really helped us to wherever we're doing Imagine Armenia forums around the world. They've they've sort of uh, activated their local chapters to help spread the word. Uh, and and fr frankly, I'm really you know sort of the, the whole concept of AGBU wanting to move their global headquarters to Armenia, I think, is phenomenally important. Uh, and we've also worked with other organizations that have also helped us, uh, uh, both um, you know AYF and I mean we've we've worked with a variety of different organizations. And you f and you find different sort of levels of engagement in different countries, but I think for for a lot of people, it's the kind of thing where, you know, um, everybody wants to say, of course I would you know I would think about moving to Armenia, but they sort of never take the next step. And a lot of times it's just about getting people to open up their minds and see what would this really be like, or what would I get out of it uh, in return. Um, and I think the last thing, and, and, I'll, and I'll stop on this. You know, when I first, uh, some couple other people mentioned this. You know, when I, f when we first said we're, you know, we're moving to Armenia. I mean, it was like there were there were the camp that said, "Are you guys nuts? What are you thinking? You know, you're in Silicon Valley, you're doing really well." And the other half was, "Our heroes, they're sacrificing their lives to go to Armenia." And the reality is, neither of those is true. But the, but those perceptions are built because of how people, uh, the perceptions of the country. And, and, and literally the reason that I got involved with, with Vartan and a few others to start Repat Armenia as a website was literally so that I wouldn't have to, sort of, on an individual basis, explain to people what I do every day when I'm here. <laughs> yes. Especially to taxi drivers. With the taxi drivers, yes. I, to I totally agree with uh, what you just mentioned, Rafi, that people thought we were sacrifices. But what my dad always mentions is like, we wouldn't have gotten the awesome education we, di we did, me and my sisters, and plus, we're three sisters. We, got, we married to three local guys, which is really, really cool. So we got a lot of things in return. We did come through, like, no electricity, no gas, nothing, but you do get a lot in return. It's like, you know, you get a hundredfold in return. So it is worth the try. <laughs> okay, uh, I think... Uh, we'll wrap it up. We're, we're around if you want to have, ask individual questions. Again, repatarmenia.org is our website. Uh, just or search for Repat Armenia on Facebook and like our page so you get uh, stay updated. Um, we are um, our office is currently right above Tashir Pizza, um, right off the Republic Square. But we are very excited to be moving to Impact Hub Yerevan, which is in the new AGBU building. We'll be there after the new year, and uh, we'd love to welcome you there as well. Thank you very much for coming.